Good evening, and um, yeah, thank you for, for coming here tonight. Um, the assignment always kind of sets me up for failure with these introductions. Uh, I'm always very nervous uh, if Simon's hosting. Um, yeah, so investing in broad-based BE shares. Uh, I think I need to start up front that I'm not here to convince you to invest in these shares. Um, I'm hoping that I can shed some light on on how to think about, you know, if you are going to invest, what kind of thought processes need to, to happen uh, inside your, your heads? How do you approach this? Because what we've observed over the years is that it's not the valuations of these underlying companies that people don't understand. You can get a valuation for SASO from any one of 40 analysts at any time. Um, but it's often a lot of the issues around these broad-based BE deals that have a big impact yeah. on what investors experience. So, so my, my uh, approach this evening is not to try and convince you to invest in any of these. Hopefully I'll give you a sense of how I think about them and you know you can apply it in your own particular setting. So the agenda for this evening, I've just talked to you very briefly about GM Investments. Um, when Simon asked me to present tonight, I said to him, cool, how much are you going to pay me? Um, you know, radical economic transformation is not going to happen on its own. And he said, no, you can't pay me, so I can do some marketing. So that's the first half hour of this presentation. <laughs> then I want to just go back to the context for public broad-based BE shares. Because um, I think as time goes on, we kind of lose that context and forget why these things are around. Then I want to revisit the historical performance because now there's a performance track record that's that's built up over years, and we can have a look at that. And then have a look at some of the shares that are currently available for trade, and um, yeah, we can have a conversation after that. So very briefly, uh, GM Investments, we turned 10 last year. We were licensed in October 2008. Um, the market players in the audience will know that that was a very uh, rough, a rough time to, to start a financial services business. Uh, we're a wealth management business and financial planning. We offer a comprehensive financial planning uh, service offering. So that, that's who we are. I do not sell shares. I do not make money from, from people investing in broad-based BE shares. We now manage just over 870 million of client money. And um, yeah. We participated in the annual private banks and wealth manager survey in 2018. We were ranked first overall, first time that's ever had that a boutique manager has ever won the overall category. We were second year in our people's choice, ranked first for lump sum investors, first for professionals, and fourth for entrepreneurs. So we were quite quite proud of, of that performance. In August 2016, we were credited as an approved professional practice by the Financial Planning Institute. Um, so as you can see, we are financial planning and wealth management. And in fact, that, that should come through my presentation as well, because there's, there's a financial planning context as well for these broad-based BE shares. And you'll see that come through in the presentation. And currently, we're about 20 staff in the business. So, so that's us. Okay. <clears throat> My favorite quote from Tabo and Becky does not come from uh, I'm an African or any one of the other poems. It comes from the 1999 BE report. We say that the struggle against racism in our country must include the objective of creating a black bourgeoisie. I would like to urge very strongly that we abandon our embarrassment about the possibility of the emergence of successful and therefore prosperous black owners of productive property. And he was speaking in the context of um, broad-based black, well, black economic empowerment. Back in 1999, it was more narrow-based black economic empowerment, more about affirmative action. And the focus back then was about employment and getting black people employed. Okay, this is the context around BE that I'm, 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 I'm chatting about very briefly. And yeah, what you see that ultimately it was about income growth and, and getting black people to earn incomes. 
Okay, and typically if you were connected, you, you got some kind of deal. Then phase two came along, and, and there the focus was on broad-based BE. So recognizing that just incomes alone and narrow-based BE was not going to, to make any kind of meaningful impact in the economy, um, we saw the introduction of the seven codes of, of good practice as far as BE was concerned. And the focus then shifted from employment to ownership. So, you know, it's no longer about affirmative action, which was renamed employment equity. It was about a whole lot more. The third phase that's, current, the phase that's currently underway is about black-owned business and procurement um, and encouraging uh, black professionals to start businesses and, and, and to start doing business with government and large corporate. But it was in terms of this ownership focus that we started to see the broad-based BEE deals come to market for the public. So as a company, if you wanted to do a BEE deal, you had a choice of four partners that you could look at. You could look at your own staff. You could look at some kind of broad-based interest group, so a women's group, a community organization, or organizations working with the disabled, for example, you could get a strategic partner, um, so a connected individual, a uh, group of individuals or consortium, or you could choose the black public. Okay, so you had a choice. And, and in fact, if you look at the data, most companies opted for the first one, staff. So a combination of the first and second one, uh, a lot of companies um, included strategic partners where, where they perhaps needed a bit of influence. Yeah, and, there, and very few companies went with the option of also including the black public in, in their deals. Okay, and a headline like this last week was a reminder of why that is the case. Uh, we were sold a Hong Kong car with a BMW sticker, says disgruntled Sasselin Zalo shareholders. Now, when I see a headline like that, it, you know, I understand the frustration of the shareholder, but I suppose just the way it's been described. And, you know, if, if I were sitting in head office deciding now which of these four partners do I, do I deal with, uh, something like that kind of deters me from, you know, including the public with, within my, my uh, universe. Okay, so, so those are the challenges that we see with, with public BE deals. Is, um, firstly, funding is a big issue. Education, um, communication. So how do you communicate with a broad base of people that, number one, speak different languages, that have very different kind of understandings of how the market works, how these deals work, have very different expectations um, very different goals, and um, you know that so investor sophistication is quite different. So it's a fairly difficult space um, to, you know, for for companies, fairly difficult decision for companies to make to to put these broad-based uh, BE shares or create some kind of scheme for for the public. And then you've also got the funding challenge. Is and I'm using Putumanati just as an example. So the funding challenge was kind of one of the biggest challenges up front. Is if you think about Putumanati, when they came to market, the multi-choice business was worth about 17 billion rand in total at that stage. To sell 20% of that company, they would need to find partners with about 3.4 billion capital. The ability to raise 3.4 billion capital, whether in equity or combination of debt and equity, and, you know, back then, it proved a bit difficult for them to, to go and find partners. Um, but the challenge that they face, and, and every other company that's done a, a BE deal, is, is actually not too different to, to someone wanting to buy a house. You know, if you want to buy a house, most of us don't have the money to go and buy that house cash. So... If you look at how they've opted to fund these deals, it's actually quite similar to the way 
you would fund the purchase of, of your own property. And this is how I would, um, this is how I would uh, describe the funding structure of broad-based BE deals in probably the most simplest of terms. So if you consider someone buying a house for a million rand, typically they would put 100,000 rand of their own cash into that transaction and get a loan for 900,000 and use their income to settle that loan over a period of 20 years. Because conceptually something we understand. And pretty much if you look at Putumanati, the share price going at 50 bucks a share. Investors pay 10 rand a share for for their stake, and there was a loan of 40 rand a share within Putumanati. And the dividends from the business was then used to settle that loan. So in essence, in its very simplest form, this is pretty much how companies approach the funding challenge. And most public BE shares are funded this way, not all of them, most of them. Um, the amount and structures of the debt differs. And I think this is where people start to kind of glaze over when they read the prospectus of some of these public uh, schemes, is because the structure of the debt tends to be fairly complex. Pref shares and, you know, non-refundable, cumulative, non-cumulative, all those kind of things. And it gets very confusing, but in this very simplest form, you're using a combination of debt and equity to buy the asset, and you use the cash from the asset to settle the debt. Okay, that funding can be in the form of a loan and or a discount. Okay, so it's not only debt and equity, there's, there's usually a discount, and I'll show that to you a bit later. Okay, so, so that's how that, uh, they tackle the, the issue of funding. I think, uh, in addition to this, it's, it's also important to remember what asset you're buying. <clears throat> because some of the deals, you, what you were buying was a subsidiary within a, a, a bigger company. So Vodacom South Africa, so Yebu Yetu bought into Vodacom South Africa, which was owned by Vodacom Limited, whereas Sassel and Zala, you were buying into Sassel Limited at the top. So if you think MTN Zakele you were buying into at that level, Putumanati, Valcom Yuzani you were buying in at that level. Okay? And I think whether it was at that level or that level created additional complexity as well. Because it's very difficult to value an unlisted business. Yes, Vodacom is listed, but Vodacom South Africa is not. So that would also be an area where we saw some some complexity coming in into the deals, particularly from a valuation perspective. Quite interesting to note that both Vodacom and Sasso are, their deals are maturing. Vodacom is flipping up from Vodacom SA to Vodacom Limited, the Yebo Yetu deal, the new deal, and Sasso is going from Sasso Limited down to Sasso South Africa. So it was quite, in, quite uh, well, I was quite interested in it. I thought it was quite funny. Um, so, how have these things performed? I think for many people, um, what I've done is I've stripped out the capital return and the total return because people seem to have focused, particularly at Sassel, on the capital returns. But when you, fa when you factor in the dividends that have been earned, you, you can sometimes get a very different number. So let me just take you through the table very quickly. It just shows the different uh, public broadcast BE shares, the start date, the initial offering price. And what I did is I said, what is the cost for 1,000 shares? If you were to buy 1,000 shares in each of these deals, what would that have costed you? What did you earn in dividends since then? And what's the latest available value um, for those shares? And based on that, what was your capital return, and then I had to do a bit of digging around to see, based on what dividends you've earned, what your total return was. And there's a clear winner here in Putumanati, which surprises me when I get hate mail for Putumanati 
every now and again is like, what are they doing? And, you know, very dissatisfied with, with what's happening in Putumanati. And it's, it's coming from various different places. Um, Tessa Inzalo, actually, you could have done quite well out of Cecil Inzalo. Um, Timbeka Capital was a fairly small deal. Very few people participated in that deal. And in fact, you could still be holding that because that was converted to PSG. But there's a, just a reminder that you could have actually lost quite a lot of your money as well. So African banks, two deals, you would have had a capital return of minus 100%, so you'd have lost all your money. Um, but thank, thank goodness for dividends that it wouldn't have been a total loss. So Valko Mizani, 15% capital return, 200% total return. So in fact, the power of dividends comes through quite clearly in some of these. If you see um, Putumanati, 980% capital return and 1,900% total return. Okay. So dividends tend to get a, people tend to kind of bypass them or look past them. But in fact, over time can be a very powerful contributor to, to performance. Just by way of benchmark, uh, the top 40 indexes delivered around 147%, including dividends, over the past 10 years. So that's, you know, I know Simon's quite, loves his index trackers. Um, that, that's Simon's return over there. Um, 147% from his, his top 40, including dividends. So <clears throat> given that context, in fact, broad-based BE deals have managed to, to deliver a higher return, which you would expect because you've taken on more risk. These are geared players. You, you, there's debt involved. You've taken on more risk. So what I want to do is I would sooner go into a couple of the issues around that, that you need to think about when deciding if you're going to continue investing in the space. And, you know, what, what I consider typically, and, and as things go along, I'll show you how these issues kind of come through on, on kind of assessing the attractiveness on some of these deals. So factors to consider. So first is the kind of the financial planning context. Okay. Um, Typically, if you're going to put an investment portfolio together, these are the kind of assets you'd look at. Uh, rental property, business, unit trust, tax-free savings account, retirement savings, your primary residence, a share portfolio, and then broad-based BE shares would be another option that you can consider. And on top of here, I'm going to show you a number of factors that you would consider when deciding where to invest. Okay, so if it's green, it means that it's, it can actually help you achieve that objective quite well. If it's red, it means that it probably, you'd probably not be able to meet your objective. So in this case, if you're looking for income, tax-free savings accounts, not the place to go and look for income. Your primary residence, not the place to go and look for income. But if you're looking for some kind of tax efficiency, well, yes, tax savings are fantastic in that regard and retirement savings as well. You get tax incentives on the way in, your returns are tax-free while you're in there. But, you know, some of the others, yes, your rental property, if your rent is less than your interest, can be quite tax efficient. If you're earning more income than you're paying in interest, well, then it's not so efficient. So that's why it's, it's amber. If we move on to liquidity, so... Those not very liquid, others actually quite liquid. And then we can move along a bit faster. And this for me is the reason that you would diversify your portfolio. Not because equity sometimes outperform bonds. It's because what you're trying to achieve often differs. And you can't get kind of all your objectives or achieve all your objectives from the same or from any one of these investment options. So when you look at broad-based BE shares in terms of your financial planning context, you'll see that you know, some of them actually generate good dividends. So you can actually get a very decent income, others not. 
So MTN Zakele paid you no dividends. You only got a capital return. Uh, some, of, so some of them tax efficient because they're giving you dividend return. Capital gains tax is more efficient than income tax. Uh, liquidity, some of them are quite liquid, others are not. But they're, they're, they're flexible, they're divisible. The big positive is that you get geared returns, and I'll talk to that a bit later. They're not bulky, so you, you own a thousand shares, you can sell ten. Um, doesn't have to be uh, a big part of your portfolio. Uh, control, yeah, you don't exercise full control over the asset, but you can go and vote at AGMs. Costs are quite low, but they're very risky because it's a geared investment, so it's very risky. So perhaps some of the Inzato shareholders needed to have been aware from a risk perspective that things are very risky. So if you risk a this is not the place to be looking at for, for returns. Okay, so, so I think that is, is an important kind of financial planning context to consider. But the other issues that I think are important is, is the issue of liquidity. Um, can anybody tell me what liquidity means, what it stands for, why it's important? The ability to sell, the ability to sell? To buy. and buy, yeah. What's the key words with liquidity? Accessible. Easily accessible. Okay. Cash, somebody say cash. So how quickly you can convert it to cash. Okay. This is the formula for calculating liquidity. <laughs> so I just want to take you through that for the next 10 minutes. Uh, but, but yeah, the ability to, of an asset to be converted to cash quickly and without any price discount. Okay, so there's actually two aspects to liquidity is how quickly can you get converted to cash and how much of a discount do you need to offer? Okay, too often we talk about how quickly can I convert it. But in fact, there's a second dynamic um, to, to the issue of liquidity. So typically, if you want to try and sell a house, and I live next to a guy who, whose property was in the market for 18 months. So for sale sign, you know how irritating it is to drive past a for sale sign for 18 months. So you, you start to feel kind of you know, whatever, whatever I bought, because I live next to the SOC. Um, but he refused to offer a discount. So he felt that the property was worth X, and he kept his price for the full 18 months. And in the end, I found out that he, he ultimately offered a discount, and he was able to move the property. Okay. So the, the liquidity issue, and you're going to see within the valuations and the trading of, of the shares that there is often a discount that's applied. So you can calculate a value for the share, but you always see that there's some kind of discount that applies um, in the broad-based BE share space. And that's because of the fact that it's a much smaller market, a very different investor profile, and you've got all these restrictions that come, tend to come with it. So what sort of discount should one expect? You know, what discount, how do you benchmark? How do you know what's a good discount and what's a... So what I looked, um, you know, it's at SASFIN. So one of the fund managers is, yeah, 30% discount. You guys need to bring that down. Uh, Casanova is kind of 20% on mutual alternative investments. They typically apply a 25% discount to uh, an alternative asset. Have your... You know, they, they demand a 30% discount for, for an e-liquid acid. So it's somewhere between 20 and 30%. Okay? So your kind of private equity guys are looking at a 25% discount when valuing assets. So I'm putting, a, putting that up there as a benchmark. So when we look at discounts later on, this is the kind of numbers that you would have in your mind um, when, when you start thinking about the discounts that you're seeing in the space. The other concept is, is the issue of market efficiency. And what market efficiency really is, is it talks to the extent to which available information is reflected in the price of an asset. Okay? The JSE is a fairly efficient market. You know, even before the news comes out, the share prices are moving. Okay, that was a joke. I mean, 
but typically as it, the, the prices come out, you see movement in it because people are watching. They're watching the sins. They, they're looking at what's happening in, in the market. And in fact, they're looking at other news, kind of two or three derivatives away from assets in their portfolios and kind of getting new information and reflecting that in the share price. Um, the BE space is not very efficient. A lot of unsophisticated investors, a lot of investors that are kind of fairly new in the market, a lot of people that are you know, not too sure how to trade, fairly practical issues, makes it a fairly inefficient market. So there's always something to, to, to bear in mind. And then the third concept is this issue of, or the concept of net asset value slash book value slash intrinsic value. And why this is important in, in the BE space is that the book value of a share is typically the assets minus the liabilities, liabilities divided by the number of shares in issue. So it's a fairly easy calculation to do. And you get a book value. And typically the book value helps an investor determine whether a stock is cheap or expensive compared to its value. So if the book value is 10 rand a share and it's trading at 8 rand, you've got to decide is that 20% discount warranted or, or not. But why it's important is the book value per share helps the common shareholder understand what they might claim should the company dissolve. And in the broad-based BE shares, you see all those companies are dissolving. Cecil and Zala is dissolving, it's being replaced by Kanisa. Yebo Yetu is dissolving, it's being replaced. Empty and Zakele, so that book value, intrinsic value, net asset value, it's, it's a fairly important number to kind of have on hand or to be able to calculate because you can observe the share price and you can compare it to the book value, especially as you get closer to the end of the deal when those companies will start dissolving. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring some of those concepts alive as we look at at these different schemes. Okay, so Putumanati, the most successful of all the deals, um, probably the one that's causing investors quite a lot of angst at the moment um, because we're not sure what's happening to DSTV as a business. You know, is it, is it going to survive? Is it not going to survive? What's happening there? But it's, it's producing pretty decent results. The earnings per share roughly well, not roughly, it's like roughly 20 Rand, specifically 20 Rand 83, and a PE of roughly 5.1, that price moves around a lot, but it was in a PE of 4.2 before that. So if investors were only prepared to pay four times profit for this business, um, it's something to get every retiree excited, a dividend yield of 20%. JSC is in a dividend yield of around 3%. Bank will pay you about 6% to 10%. So these are pretty phenomenal yields. The reason that you have that, though, is that there, there's no liquidity event likely with Putumanati. It's not going to unwind or unbundle, or it's an evergreen event. Uh, what's this thing? Um, scheme. Okay, so that valuation is likely to stay suppressed for a bit longer. Until the market gets a lot bigger and more and more players come into the market, uh, it's likely to stay at these levels. But there are fairly real concerns around. I've seen valuations from some of the companies that value NASPAR. So when they do that, some of the parts valuation, you see valuations for that multi-choice business um, in the region of 160 to about 200 rand a share. So a fairly reasonable discount. And, yeah, they've been in the news because, you know, the CEO calling for Netflix to be regulated somehow. And other over-the-top applications are proving to be a major challenge. Okay, people's kind of consumption of entertainment which I think is the terms and the kind of language they use. Those, those patterns and those trends are changing. And that's, that's proving to be a bit of a 
a challenge. So it they, they looks like there needs to be some fairly major work done at DSTV in order for those valuations to, to change. But until that happens, you're likely to see this to be a yield play. People would see it pretty much as a utility, price it as a utility. Not much growth prospects, but generates fantastic cash, so you can expect a pretty decent dividend. Okay, so on Putumanati, if you need income, probably wait until after the dividend, you'll be able to buy most more shares as the price drops back into the 80 Rand kind of range, and you can start collecting, or you can buy it now with the dividend, and hopefully the price kind of remains in the late 80s to early 90s. Um, but the growth prospects for Putumanati don't look that great. And I think that's why it's been given such a fairly low uh, rating by the market. MTM Zakele Futi. Um, MTM Zakele has unwound about two years ago, was replaced by Zakele Futi. What I just wanted to show you here was how they funded that deal. Kind of take your mind back to some of the earlier slides. So that was a 9.8 billion rand deal. 56% of that was funded by debt. MTN offered a 20% discount. And us as investors put in 25% of that. That was a fairly, what I, th I thought was a fairly well-structured deal. A fairly good balance between debt, equity, and a fairly generous discount. But it was undersubscribed. It was undersubscribed. And this is where, you know, people were fairly upset about MTN Zakele. They were so upset that they were blinded to, to what was being put in front of them. Um, MTN Zakele didn't do badly. It did 180%. If you invested on day one and you got out at the end, you made 180% return. You made a fairly good return compared to the market, despite MTN itself doing fairly poorly over the period. People were fairly upset by that, and in fact, a fantastic opportunity bypassed a lot of investors. Um, so hopefully, if we don't see that with Cecil and Zala as well, or Vodacom Yebo Year Two, because th those are the deals that are currently unwinding. But I took this from the MT and Zakele Futi prospectus because it neatly demonstrates those geared returns I was talking about. MTN, this shows the value of MTN Zakele Futi based on the MTN share price. So at 100 Rand a share, Zakele Futi is worth about 17.70. If that share price goes up 20%, that increase there is worth, what's that, about a 60, 70% increase. Okay, if it goes up 80% from 100 to 180, that's a 280% increase in the value of, of your investment in Zakele Futi. Okay, but remember it works the other way around as well. So if it goes from 180 to 100, okay, that's what's that, a 60%, 56% drop in the price, that's about a 77% drop in the price. Okay, so gearing works both ways. Okay, so when it's going up, it's lacquer. Twitter is all happy. When it's going down, it's a different story. Okay, But what this illustrates is that those geared returns that I was talking about is that you can make fairly good returns, but you do need to have a long-term mindset when it comes to these, these shares. So Zakele Futi will be able to trade from next year, I think next year, September, October, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, Vodacom Yebo Yetu, currently unwinding. Um, essentially, there's about 7 billion rands worth of value in Vodacom Yebo Yetu. 3 billion will be paid out as a dividend. The other 4 billion will be invested in the new deal. Fairly simply. So this deal, worth 16.4 billion. There's a 11% discount. Okay, not as generous as MTN, so maybe next time you take out a contract, think about that. 
Um, your equity contributions, roughly 25%, fairly similar number, and about 60% debt funded. Okay, so fairly balanced, fairly reasonable structure. And that's how they've, they've paid for the other 0.4% is for transaction costs and things like that. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the detail, but essentially what what you're seeing in the announcement is they, they're unwinding the existing structure to implement the new structure. So they first got to unwind Yebo Yetu in order to implement Yebo Yetu Investments, which is the new deal. And in that structure, they're going to flip up from Vodacom South Africa to Vodacom Limited. Okay, so you're no longer going to only have exposure to the South African assets, which actually did fairly well for, for, for investors because, because of its cash generation ability, it was able to settle the debt within that deal and give investors a very good return. But now you're getting exposure to all the global assets and the growth that's outside of South Africa. So these steps is really, there, there's a special dividend that will be paid, roughly 73 rand a share. Okay? You pay 25 rand a share to get in. Okay, so there you can see the, the value of waiting. And then restructuring the ESOP and the special, I mean, the um, strategic partners being RBH and Tebe. And ultimately, you're going to land up with Vodacom Group shares inside Yebo Yetu. Okay, so, so that's what those circulars that you're getting are all about. Because that process is going to play out in September. Okay, you're going to get a bit of cash, but then you're also going to get your new Vodacom Yebo Yetu Investments shares. And that will have Vodacom Group as the underlying asset. Okay, so there's not going to be a new issue of Vodacom. You're not going to have to line up at Medbank or the post office, heaven forbid, um, to get exposure to the new Yebo Yetu deal. Okay, it's currently trading around, and when I put the slide together, it was at 109 rand a share. And the deal was struck, the, the deal was struck at 143 rand a share, which implied a price of 159 for Yebo Yetu. Okay, it's current, Vodacom's currently trading at 124 rand a share. So from 143, it's gone down even further. I see today, it, yesterday it was at 129 rand a share. So it implies a price of around 130 to 135 rand a share for uh, Yebo Yetu, which equates to a 20% discount. Okay, if you think back to the other slide, 20% is pretty much at the bottom end. So it's kind of a reasonable discount. So 15 to 20% seems quite reasonable. Um, the way I see it going forward, because remember the discount's not going to stay there. As the share price moves, it could increase or it could narrow. For me, uh, the way I'm playing it is, is more as a geared play on Vodacom. Okay, recognizing that it's an inefficient market, Vodacom's going to move. A few days or weeks later, Yebo Yetu will move based on how Vodacom moves. Um, so that I see as a geared play on, on Vodacom. Um, but you will earn some dividends out of the new deal while you're waiting for, for that deal to, to kind of play out. Okay, it's not going to be overly generous in the beginning because there's a new pile of debt and that has to be settled. Um, but it's not unreasonable. So I think this one I'd watch, kind of watch the Vodacom share price and then monitor the discount and, and use that to, to as, a, as a trigger for whether I buy or not. So when that discount gets a bit too big, maybe time to get in. Sassel, okay, there were two Sassel shares, the B ordinary shares, that was a discounted share, and then the Sassel and Zala. Okay, I'll talk to the first one, the ordinary shares, B ordinary shares, the discounted scheme. These shares run peri pesu with Sassel ordinary shares. What that means is you get the same voting rights and you get the same dividend as an ordinary Cecil share. Okay. Discount, currently 43%. When I put the slide together. 
So the sales rule then was our 505, and sell B1 was trading at 286 Rand a share. Okay. Question you would ask yourself is that perhaps a bit too big a discount, or is it fair? I don't know. Dividend yield on on sol B1 currently about five percent, but we think that Sasol will increase and start increasing its dividends again. So you could see that dividend actually going up to as high as seven percent, depending on where the the share price is. Because remember, you get the same dividend as an ordinary Sasol shareholder. Okay, a few years ago, those shares, those dividends were around 16, 17 rand a share. As a percentage of 286 rand, pretty decent dividend. If you're looking for income, perhaps a decent place to look. Okay, value may emerge from the discount unwinding, but also from the overhang of stock in the Kinesa restructuring. And I'm going to talk about Kinesa just now. So, Kinesa shareholders are going to get free Solby one shares. And we expect that a lot of them may sell to, to get the initial investment back. Okay, so the discount should be higher for a bit longer. So I wouldn't rush to get in just yet. But I'd, I'd keep monitoring that, that gap. Okay, there's no funding structure in this one. It's a straightforward calculation. What's the price of Sol B1? What's the price of Sasol? What discount do I get? And if that discount's too big, you can buy. How I play it? There's a bit of a yield play as well as a discount play. Okay, anything over a 6% dividend yield gets me fairly excited. Okay, that's me personally. Um, my wife, she gets excited for shopping and other stuff. Dividend yields turn me on. Okay, anything under 4% would imply that it's a bit, a bit expensive. I buy when the discount's over 40%, and I, I have been buying at over 40%. Tend to hold between 40, 25, and 40 percent, and I tend to sell below the 25 percent kind of level. Okay, those are my triggers for selling, not what some analyst thinks Sasol share price is going to be in a year's time. Okay, so monitor these things. So, with I've, I've sold two B shares in my life, but typically I, I tend to buy them and hold them. The first one I sold was Sasol in Zalo when. The discount to its net asset value disappeared. It was about a couple of years ago when Cecil and Zala traded over 100 and a share. If you did the NAV calculation, the net asset value was below 100. The price was trading above 100. I sold. The other time I sold was MT and Zakele. The discount went to about 5%. Okay. So even though at that time things were looking good for MTN, uh, because the, the discount was so narrow, I sold out of the, the MTN um, Zakele shares and waited for the discount to widen again. Didn't have to wait too long because the MTN fell, uh, share price fell off a cliff. So, so uh, monitoring the discount becomes quite important when you're looking in the, the broad base B share space. Um, it's, it's a key trigger for me in terms of whether I should buy or, or sell. Kanisa. Kanisa is very busy unwinding at the moment, or well, it's kind of in Zalo's converting to, to Kanisa. Okay, it's Cecil's funded offer. Okay, there's debt involved in this one. So, yeah, if they didn't learn from Inzalo, which was 95% debt funded, they've now gone and made 100% debt funded for Kanisa. But there's a reason for that, and a very good reason for that. Okay. The other thing, opposite to Vodacom, what they're doing is Kanisa will invest in Sasol South Africa, not in Sasol Limited, as in Zala was. And it's for the same reason that Vodacom and Putumanati were successful, in that you had the subsidiary which generated all the cash for the business. And Sasol South Africa is a cash generator for Sasol. So whenever Cecil South Africa pays a dividend to Cecil, it will pay a dividend to Kanisa, and they'll use that dividend to, to settle the debt in those schemes, or in, in Kanisa. Okay, so that 100% debt funding 
in that context actually becomes a bit more palatable. But I, I think it was not, it wouldn't have been politically um, kind of appropriate of them to ask investors for another equity injection. So I think that's why they went with that. Okay, and then you get a free share allocation based on the number of Sassel and Zalo shares and the code for Sassel and Zalo is CPE. So instead of typing it out, I just took a screenshot. So if you held Sol BE1, 100 Sol BE1s, you got 25 free for electing to remain in Sol BE1, and then you got another 10 free for participating in Kanisa. And you got 100 Kanisa shares for opting to participate in Kanisa. So your 100 Sol BE1 shares now is 135 Sol BE1 shares, plus um, you're going to get 100 Kanisa shares. Okay, that's how they're unwinding this thing and restructuring it. And the reason for that is that Sol BE1 is no longer going to convert to SAS for ordinary shares. So they're compensating you for that with a 35% extra allocation because they're expecting the discount to widen. Okay? The discount is definitely going to widen, and it, in fact it has widened to about 43%, because Sol B1 is effectively an evergreen scheme, just like Putumanati. So Putumanati, there's no wind-up date. There's no date where the scheme ends. The same is going to happen with Cecil, Sol B1. Okay, those of you that owned Inzalo shares, for every 100 Inzalo shares, you, you, get, you were given 10 Sol B1 shares plus 100 Kanisa shares. So as things stand, you have 100 Inzalo shares, 10 Sol B1 shares, and 10 Kanisa shares. The problem is, and I think this is what's causing a lot of angst and giving us the headlines, is that we don't have a value for those two shares as things stand. So as they're unwinding the scheme, this is now frozen at 95 rand a share. This essentially has no value. Okay, the value will emerge over time as they start paying down the debt. Um, but we don't know what they sold the Cecil shares inside in Zalo for. If they got a price over 470 rand, there may be some value there still. But your value is going to come essentially from your Sol B1 shares and over time from your Kanisa shares. Okay. It's quite a lot. I, I try to keep it as simple as possible, but sometimes you can't get away from the technicalities. Okay. So essentially they're saying, sorry, we messed up, but there's a much better scheme, in essence. It's not going to cost you anything. So these were the design, design considerations. And if you look through the design considerations, I'm not going to go through them all. They essentially learned from Putumanati and Vodacom Yebo Yetu. Okay. Invest in the cash cow. Don't put too much debt, although in their case they didn't have an option from that perspective. And there's no reliance on third-party debt. So at least they can control the cost of debt. And the scheme is to become evergreen in the same way Putumanati is, is an evergreen scheme. And minimize the complexity. So you should see much better communication coming out of Cecil can you say, than you did out of Vinzala. Okay, I won't go through that in any great detail, but essentially it's a fully vendor-funded scheme. So no money needed from investors. Value creation on day one from your Sol B1 shares, which you can trade today. Um, it's an evergreen scheme and pretty much market-related costs for, for the SAS or ordinary shareholders, that it wasn't a very expensive scheme. Okay, and I think this is the last deal that I look at, where um, Ukamba. Any, anybody invested in Ukamba here? Yeah. Okay, there are one or two. Okay, it's, it's a fairly small deal, but not too many people know about it. Um, this was essentially Imperial staff scheme. It's Imperial's ESOP, uh, which had a 25-year term on it. I talk about teaching people patience. It's 25 years, and unsurprisingly, the staff complained. So what they did is they restructured and they created these A shares. And essentially, the A shares own 5.3% of Imperial, 
and the BNC shares the staff have kept and they have got Imperial and they've got some other investments in there. So you are allowed to trade in the A shares in this deal. And the way they structured it, there was some kind of arrangement that they put in place with Investec, but about 831,000 shares, kind of deferred ordinary shares, um, vest in Ukamba on an annual basis. Okay, you still got to be patient. Another two World Cups, now one more World Cup before you get your money. Um, so June 2025, you'll get Imperial shares for your Ukamba shares. Um, currently, net asset value, well, Imperial is trading a lot higher than 160 Rand a share, so so that net asset value is a bit higher. I think it's probably closer to about 40, 42 Rand a share. And there's a bit of corporate activity at Imperial, which would result in Ukamba splitting as well. So you're going to get Ukamba, Ukamba Logistics and Ukamba Motors, which is the automotive business, <coughs> excuse me, within Imperial. Okay. So roughly a 42% discount on net asset value for Ukamba, um, but a seven-year maturity period. So it actually seems a bit fair that it's, it's slightly higher. But if you look two years from now and it's still 42%, then perhaps it's a bit more attractive. Um, just from the discount disappearing, you get a 73% return. <clears throat> so if all things stay the same, if the imperial share price doesn't move, the discount disappearing gives you 73% upside, which over a seven-year period is, is not too, too horrible. Okay, you will get dividends as well from there. So, so that's the shares. I haven't looked at Balco Mizani because I think I've also run out of time. Yeah, I've got four minutes left. So, do I have four minutes left? Five, four, okay. Three, two, okay. So, big picture. Um, don't try and guess which is the best opportunity to invest in. So, over the years, when I do these presentations, I get, I know, but, you know, Sassu and Zala looks like it can do well over the next year because of, just diversify. You know, you've got a decent return investing in all of the schemes. Okay. And yes, I lost money in the African banks, both of their schemes. I lost all my money, just like you did. Um, but I got my fantastic returns out of Putumanati. Okay, so the principle of diversification applies as well. So do not invest money that you can't afford to lose or that you may need at short notice because you may have to offer a fairly big discount to get your money out at short notice. It's a small market, relatively. Okay, there are no guarantees. Absolutely no guarantees. Ask any African bank shareholder investor. Gearing means volatility. Okay, it's fantastic on the upside. It hurts like hell on the downside. Okay, but it's over time, it, it should work out quite well. And understand your current financial position. What are you trying to achieve from the investment? Because in fact, the answer may not be broad-based BE shares. Okay, it may be something else. Okay, where do you trade these shares? I'm not going to take you through all of that, but Sasso and Yebo Yetu, you try by your stock broker. Just make sure that they offer the BE contract, because not all of them do. Now, everybody loves easy equities. I don't think they offer the, the BE contract. Your bank broker, as far as I know, I know FNB Security does, PSG does, Consilium does, uh, Sasfit. Sasfin does. There we go. So we'll send you an invoice for that. Okay, and then the others are traded over the counter. So Putumanati.coza, ValcomShares.coza, and then Equity Express, you just click on UKH if you're interested in getting Ukamba. Okay, so, so Kele Futi, not trading yet, but probably will go on the JSCB board. And Kanisa as well will probably go on the JSCB board when it does come to market. Uh, so Kelly Footy will come next year. Kanisa, I think, is a few more years afterwards. Okay, and yeah, the diversification, you can actually build up a pretty decent portfolio. Okay. 
you know, I know guys are trading Bitcoin. <laughs> they need my data from these two places. They're still driving cars, but uh, anyway. So a parting shot, my final slide, to kind of bring everything together. You know, in our industry, everybody tends to follow Warren Buffett. We, in our business, we actually follow the Yale and Diamond Fund. Okay, and the reason for that is that Warren Buffett's driving the bus and he's going to wherever he wants to go, and those people are going with him. In my business, my clients want to go different places. And so I've got to put a strategy in place to get them to where they're going. Okay, and it's the same with the Yale and Diamond Fund. The people that manage this fund have a fairly specific requirement from Yale University. So this portfolio has got to work for the university. And in fact, I think it's in the top 1% uh, performance-wise of all institutional funds in the U.S. over the last 25, 30 years. Fairly well-performing fund. Picked up the um, annual report in 2000, and this caught my attention. The heavy allocation to non-traditional asset classes stems from their return potential and diversifying power. Alternative assets, by their very nature, tend to be less efficiently priced than traditional marketable securities, providing an opportunity to exploit market inefficiencies through active management. Sorry, Simon. Um, the endowment's long-time horizon is well-suited to exploiting illiquid, less efficient markets. Okay, and that's what we have in the BE space. It's an illiquid, less efficient market. To be successful in this market, you need to have a long-term horizon. Okay, because those opportunities are going to open and close from time to time. And you could potentially land up with a return like the Yale Diamond Fund that is much better than market, much better than competitors over time. Okay, you can't prove anything I've said. Oh, no, they're recording. Um, but this doesn't con constitute advice. Okay. And that's our license number. So thank you very much.